Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about conserving aquatic species with Roger German, President and CEO of the Florida Aquarium, Keith Sanford, President and CEO of the Tennessee Aquarium, and Vicki Spruill, uh, President and CEO of the New England Aquarium. So thank you all for coming. I'm so excited about this. You know, when you when you look at the planet from, from space, it's very clear that, you know, 70, 71% of the planet is covered by water. Uh, there's a huge unseen diversity of life uh, beneath the water. Every one of us is so dependent on the oceans. I'm, I'm going to ask a very, very obvious question, Roger, because this has been your work, your life's work. Everyone here has, has participated. Why is it important? Why is it important that we know about our oceans? Well, it's, it's extremely important. Thanks for having me here. It's great to be with my colleagues, Vicki and Keith as well. Look, it's extremely important. We are so connected. And I think you gave those stats earlier about the coronavirus, but let's talk about how the fact that humans and nature, both above water and what we our passion is, is underneath the surface, are so much more intertwined and connected than I think we recognize. You know, it's easy to go to a grocery store and get your proteins. It's easy to, you know, see your, your tap turn on and you forget about everything that's under the surface. So we've all dedicated our lives to making sure that folks understand really truly what's happening under the surface and, and how we're connected. I mean, the biodiversity uh, is absolutely amazing. And, and I'll give just real quick uh, two things. So one is I grew up in the city of Chicago. So I'm in the middle of the country and yet it was right on uh, uh, the edge of Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes. 90% of fresh water in North America is in the Great Lakes. And for most people who I grew up around in the blue collar areas that I grew up, as long as that tap turned on and off, that was all you cared about. Didn't pay attention to the brown and silver fish under there. You know, thought things like zebra mussels were great because now I can see the bottom of the lake, but didn't realize that climate change was making the water you know, warmer. And then, you know, you had to treat it differently in order to get your drinking water. Now I'm here in Tampa, Florida. And, you know, it's one of those states that is surrounded and intertwined with water. And to see that, you know, the biodiversity, the, the, the life that is under here, that is connected to our quality of life is really important. So our, we've dedicated, I've dedicated my life, the Florida Aquarium is dedicated to making sure people understand uh, what's underneath the surface and why it's important. And Keith, you're not you're not in a state that's surrounded by water, are you? But uh, uh, but here yeah. you are with you know sitting in an aquarium. There is tremendous interest where you are in aquatic species and in and in uh, the oceans. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that with uh, the changes in the climate, um, cl you know, uh, inland uh, the U.S. is very deeply affected. Uh, whether it's uh, availability of water. Um, through uh, through uh, uh, moisture and the and the rising temperatures that that we're experiencing, uh, these strange weather patterns. Uh, how do you um, experience your audience interests uh, where you are there in Tennessee? Well, we're a little different than that because we're not a coastal aquarium, and so about sixty percent of our exhibit is for, uh, through freshwater animals that. And we have rivers around the world, so you can see, you know, the creatures, the sturgeon from Russia or the, you know, an alligator from, or a crocodile from Africa, those types of things. And we do have the fresh water, but we, we really trace a drop of water that starts in the headland streams of the Tennessee River and ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. But we also show that whatever you drop in the river here also ends up in the Gulf of Mexico, if that's plastic or trash or whatever, it all affects, it all ends up in the same place. So when I was a kid, it was not unusual to, for people to throw things out of the car to clean out the car, right? That's not the, that is not the sensibility today. And you're a big part of that. Vicki, your aquarium is one of the oldest in the world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, could you talk a, a little bit about inventing this field and how you have seen it evolve through the years. Well, I wanna go back to what Roger said uh, and thank you to my colleagues and, and to you, Mark, for including me today. Um, we are the, the uh, we're 50 years old. We are the first modern aquarium in the country. We're sitting literally on the water's edge on Central Wharf in Boston. And 
I want to just echo this notion that we're all connected, that water is all connected. We should have been called planet ocean, not planet earth. And every other breath we take comes from the ocean. So I don't, I don't think um, there's anything sort of more vital than that. I think what's really special about uh, the New England Aquarium is that we were founded with conservation and a conservation ethos really baked into our DNA. And so we've tried to take advantage of our proximity to the ocean, um, the concerns we have around climate change, and um, really connect the dots for people around how all of that works. So one of the things that, that, that I'm wondering is we don't do politics on this show at all. Um, we are here though in a situation in this, in this particular Zoom meeting with uh, people from different states. You have the, uh, the Florida um, a situation, the Tennessee situation, the, uh, the Massachusetts situation where people have different <laughs> views of science of how do you how do you triangulate? Because you know we've often said that that if we can't agree on facts, we can't really even have a discussion. Uh, you all are dealing in a fact based world. You're dealing with sturgeon, or you're dealing with um, with uh, ocean uh, species. Um, you're dealing with uh, climate. How do we deal with facts? And Keith, I'd like to to start with you in terms of. Uh, how do you interact with your audience um, in a way that, that makes them part of this? Not, not that you're talking down to them um, or that, that you are trying to genericize what you're doing so that there's never any controversy. How do you, how do you create that balance to have a really invigorating part, be a really invigorating part of America's dialogue surrounding ecology, oceans, rivers, and so on. Well, we, you know, the Stokes Monkey Trial was famously about 30 miles north of Chattanooga. So this area is still fairly conservative in that. And what we've tried to do is not politicize. We teach and we don't preach. And we mm -hmm. give facts and not uh, political statements. And so we try to do that in all of our exhibit literature, our online stuff. And we have an IMAX and, you know, IMAX can get pretty daring in a lot of the big screen movies about climate change. And it's in, you know, we talk a lot about climate change and, but again, we're teaching and not preaching and we do get some pushback, but it, you know, we just kind of brush it off and keep doing what we do. So it's, so it's really about, in part, it's about um, a, a respect for your audience, not talking down, teaching, not preaching. Um, also, um, finding within yourself the wherewithal to patiently process people's objections, right? So you're, you're trying to really understand how to connect with people. And Roger, you're also, you've got a, you, you've got a, a, um, a, a series of challenges um, where you are as well, right? It, it, are you using the same kind of an approach that Keith outlined in terms of, of just trying to convey information and letting the facts speak for themselves? Yeah, that's, that's one of the cool things I think about our industry and our business per se, right? So one of the things that we you know, try to serve is be the cool science teacher. Right. So you talk about the facts, but be cool, have fun with it, you know, um, you know, really engage people, um, you know, that I mean, I remember when again, when I grew up and my science teacher blew something up and you just remember those things. Right. So we want to be that cool science teacher. We want to provide, as Keith said, we want to provide those facts, um, you know, and, and not be preachy at the time. Now, there's two things that we also do, and I think we do really well and my colleagues do really well um, as well. The fact is, one is, um, you know, one, some, a lot of us work behind the scenes, right? You know, from that standpoint. So use our voice. Look, the state of Florida, I still say, is a purple state, right? And the reality of it is, is it's, you know, third largest state in the nation. We have uh, the ability to, to have some influence on national policy, um, but we want to stay too true to our mission, right? Be that cool science teacher, be fact based, not get into the partisan back and forth, but we do have a voice. And so the fact that we can talk to both Republican and Democratic uh, U.S. senators, we can talk to candidates that come through this state, 
you know, we, 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 you know, kind of make science cool and we, and we make it very fun and, and, and engaging. The second piece is one of the messages that we've also given more recently is the fact that this interconnectivity and that we are intertwined. So one of the things that I've said many times to our elected officials and to our public is the economy and the environment are not mutually exclusive. We can work together, right? The quality of life, you know, and having some science here can be mutually exclusive. And we're kind of shifting away from what I call the, you know, the, 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 the society of and. It's either or, and I don't believe it is, it's and. And we, we focus on the and here, you know, at the Florida Aquarium in Tampa. I'll give one shout out, you know, for instance, you talk about partisan politics, but, um, and not to go political, but, you know, we have a current Republican governor and I'm gonna talk environment for the moment. He's the first governor who's put together a chief scientist here for the state of Florida. He's put more money into restoring the Everglades and you know, our environment you know, than, than probably any governor in modern time. And yet he's affiliated with a certain party. I'm not trying to get into party, but here, here's an opportunity where education and organizations like ours who can have meaningful dialogue that people are resonating with, voters are resonating with, and elected officials are resonating, that's how you're gonna move the needle for change. Mark, if I- Interesting point, Vicki? I was just going to say, I, I'd like to push the envelope just a little bit on this one, because I think we're finding, at least among our visitors, that they're asking us for more ways in which they can directly engage in the political and policy process. And so uh, we're, we're experimenting with things like post writing, postcard writing campaigns, um, which have been really effective, where our visitors are, are writing in for things like protecting um, 30% of the ocean by 2030, which was a part of President Biden's new climate executive order. And it's been really interesting to see um, the, the, I don't want to say pressure, but the, the encouragement our visitors are giving us to play more actively in this advocacy space. And I've seen that shifting over the last, you know, three to five years, and as I think these issues get more prominent. You're talking about a particular type of advocacy. It's not a political advocacy. Right. It's not about party. Right. Right. And that was your point, Roger. And, and Keith, you were also making a, a similar point in that you were talking about how you interact with people. It's really about advocacy for, um, for uh, the oceans, for aquatic species, for clean rivers. Right, that's going to be really important. You know, Keith. You know, the drinking water uh, comes uh, comes directly out of out of that those aquifers. That drop that that drops on a on a hillside is going to end up being being consumed by human beings and by and by different species along the way. So you're not talking about political advocacy. You're talking about advocacy for a certain way of thinking, aren't you, Vicky? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And one of the things that I find to be very interesting about Roger's um, um, uh, example of Governor DeSantis's support of the Everglades is that if you look at Massachusetts, you also have a state which famously elects a lot of uh, Republican governors, but is, is very uh, a, a, a blue state uh, area. So there are <laughs> ways in which we can kind of get over ourselves. We always talk about division, but is, is division really our fate or can we just actually through employing some of Keith's um, uh, strategies, can we actually create that connection between the various uh, sides here and find out that we're actually all on the same side? Well, and we're also observing because we are right on the water's edge, climate change, for example, we do a lot of talking about it, but we're also seeing the direct impacts of it with sea level rise and storm surges where two years ago because of a king tide, you know, we were closed for three days as were many of the businesses around Central Wharf and we alone lost a million dollars during those closures. So people are really understanding this connection between economy and climate and it's, it's absolutely not either or, it's and and we have to live with it and figure out what we're gonna do. One of the things that, that uh, just occurred is we just closed out the first, uh, the first poll and 92% of the respondents said that, that they don't believe that our country is doing enough to protect our oceans. So let's, let's go with that and, and let's talk a little bit about Roger's point about the, <laughs> the whole issue of there, there is an economic logic uh, for this because very often protection of, of oceans or environmental work there's, there's a view amongst um, a group of people 
and there's evidence for this, that you invest in a social good, it's like throwing money in the wind, right? You, you invest in it, where is the return? So Roger, since you made the point previously, can we talk a little bit about Florida and where that return is? And then we're gonna go around the table. Let's, let's go to Vicki next and then Keith. But Roger, is there an economic return in a clean environment and clean oceans for Florida? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's huge. Um, uh, so a couple of things. So one of the things that we focus on here at the Florida Aquarium is we've doubled down on trying to save what's called the Florida Reef Track. So it's really North America's only coral reef. It's the third largest barrier reef in the world. And it runs from kind of the Fort Lauderdale area down to the Dry Tortugas. Most of us don't pay attention to it because it's you know, so isolated from you know, the rest of the other uh, you know, 48 contiguous states and we just don't pay attention. But let's talk about Florida for the moment. So that coral reef in general, just in the sport fishing business alone is eight, eight to $10 billion just in that region. So there is a huge economic benefit to the state of Florida, um, you know, and especially that particular region. Now you throw on all the, you know, what the barrier reefs do from, you know, all of the marine life that, that spends some time there, you know, during its life cycle. Um, that could even be, you know, dolphins that spend time here in, in Tampa area. And why you come here to visit and spend your tourism dollars to see the dolphins jump in the bay you know, could spend some time down there in the coral reef, right? Um, you know, the sea turtles that are that go up the coast and that, you know, Vicky is so great of rescuing when they get, you know, frostbite and sending them back to me to, 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 to get warm again. Those all spend some time in, in you know, in, in the coral reefs here in Florida. So point being is it's just one example, <clears throat> again, how it's intertwined. Now, if you want to move to the state of Florida and live here, I mean, we are talking about sea level rise and we're talking about issues because housing and hotels are all built along the coastline as well. So, it's part of it, it, one thing I'll say, and then to turn it over real quick, here's one of the interesting things I found like through recycling and a few other things. A lot of folks say that, you know, the country, the city, your county is not doing enough. Um, and, and I agree that ultimately we need to keep doing more. We need to have strong policies and regulations in place. But still at the end of the day, there is a responsibility for all of us to recognize. Because one of the things that I find in the challenge of recycling is most people when you do surveys feel like, oh, the government's gonna figure that out. They're gonna fix it. They're gonna give me a green bin instead of a blue bin and do it. But if you don't put something in the green bin, it doesn't matter what the government can do, right? So there is this, I think this is where the aquariums can step up because there's this individual responsibility in action that don't just leave it to somebody else to solve it. We all have play a part and can solve it. So uh, all right. we all we all agree, right? We are the Absolutely. government. We are the people. The government is us. It's it's time for us every day to 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 make that investment, right, Roger? Yeah, absolutely. And Vicky? Yeah. So um, you know, we are in a in a different environment. We sit uh, on a, a very we call it our urban ocean, uh, a very industrialized ocean with aquaculture and wind energy and shipping. And so I'm very proud of some work that we are doing now. We have partnered with a startup uh, technology incubator called Sea Ahead, and we're really um, innovating in this blue tech space, trying to work directly with industry and using our expertise in conservation to help um, uh, wind farm producers, for example, better site their wind turbines. And so there's this um, very synergistic partnership that's developing. Uh, and we've, we've just um, named our first cohort of six um, startup companies. And so it's very exciting as we sit here in the innovation capital of the world in Boston to, to be really seeing conservation and economy and business come together in, in really profound ways. So for you, when, when you take a look at this, for Roger, there's, there's this huge, huge uh, economy surrounding environmental tourism of various types. Yeah. For you, you're talking about your economy, which is an education-oriented economy, an innovation-oriented yeah. economy. You also have this very long history uh, with the oceans and, and trade and, and so on. So you're basically talking about galvanizing the business community around not only these traditions, but also around this intellectual capital that is so much part of, of the Massachusetts economy. Uh, Keith, how, how do you see um, how you interact with the business and economic interests of Tennesseans? Well, um, obviously tourism is important. To our, it's our second biggest industry in Tennessee. And 
So we're a big economic driver for that. And I'm on the state tourism board. Sport fishing is a huge thing here. So we have a conservation institute that has, we're uh, put, putting native brook trout back into the headland streams of the Tennessee so that they can thrive again. We're studying these little fish, uh, freshwater fish that are getting, their food is getting eaten by mosquitoes. And so we're, we're trying to figure out how to do these Barron's top minnows. We have put hundreds of thousands of lake sturgeon back into the Tennessee River and they were extinct 20 years ago in the river. And now they're finally hitting sexual maturity, which is about age 18. And hopefully we can start, but we found them a whole, a whole stretch of the river. Three years ago, we partnered with the University of the South and had a German scientist swim the whole length of the Tennessee River and uh, collect samples of plastics, pollution, and chemicals. And he did the same thing in the Rhine River. And we found out we have 10 times the plastic of the Rhine, and the Rhine has 10 times the population. And so we had just bought a microscope spectrometer at the start of this thing, and we're, he had come back with, with uh, someone at the University of the South and was going to work with us for a year studying the microplastics. And when COVID hit, he had to go back to Germany. So that's kind of gotten mm -hmm. put on hold for a while. But we think that's very important to our community. We found our pollution <clears throat> is much better than it used to be. But we get a lot of chemicals around wastewater treatment plants, particularly estrogen from birth control pills. And the fish that are born near those uh, plants are 90% female. Hmm. That, that, that's, that's, that's so interesting. You know, you can't escape the impact of human beings. And the only people who can change the impact of human beings are, are human beings, right? <laughs> so you, you have to share that information, right, Vicki? When, when, let, let, let's look at, um, at, at your various programs here. And by the way, we just uh, finished another poll. And the, um, the, the second poll was really about where people learn about these issues. And they learn about these issues, guess what, from aquariums, um, also from schools and so on. But aquariums play such a big, big uh, role in this sort of edutainment idea, which some, sometimes is viewed as an anathema to pure academics. It really is part of engaging people. So Vicki, let's talk a little bit about how you shape your programs because you have living um, uh, species that you know, COVID shut down that Keith referred to, you can't shut off, uh, <laughs> you can't shut down the, the aquarium, turn out the lights and come back a month later and find everything still alive. So you have that sort of everyday work. You have the scientific work, you have the, the work that you do in collaboration with your business community, but you also have tons of people walking through those doors on a, you know, in a normal uh, era when we're not in pandemic, and you also have a lot of programs, you're doing a lot online. Could you just sort of unpack what you're doing and then we'll go around to Roger and then back to Keith. So I think maybe this has been a silver lining to the pandemic and yes, we, um, we educate and we inspire. We, if, if you don't, if you're not inspired to understand more about the ocean, you're not gonna take action and make those changes in your daily lives. So that's, that's sort of the bottom line. But I think, you know, we've been closed for two big chunks of time, um, March through mid July, and then again, December until this coming Friday, February 5th, where we're getting to open again. And so we have had to, as I'm sure my colleagues have as well, turned to virtual programming and it's here to stay because we have been able to attract so many more visitors. So we've done everything from, um, I think we've produced 225 different shows. I'm gonna give you a run for your money, Mark, um, in, in showcasing our behind the scenes staff who have become Facebook stars you know, by showing all that happens uh, behind the scenes to help tell the story of what we do. We've launched a virtual academy where we're working with teachers to give them, again, special experiences with penguins or with our turtles. Uh, and, and then we're offering packages for virtual experiences, for birthday parties, for corporate events. And so um, it has been so exciting to, um, 
and, and this pandemic has had to push our thinking. How do we use the more limited resources we have um, to better advantage? And um, I, I am so excited about bringing, I think what it has done more than anything is brought forward the complexity and the interesting things that happen behind the scenes that you just don't have a chance to tell any other way. And, and you're telling those stories. Your programs are going to be different than Keith's programs. Yeah, right? they are. Because and that's well, important. Well, and we, uh, you know, we're a little unusual in that. Um, so we're probably best known scientifically for our work on the North Atlantic right whale. We've been doing that for, you know, 40 years. Um, more and more, we're trying to draw a more direct connection between the science that we're doing and what you see inside of our our facility. And that's, there's no place where that connection is tighter than with turtles. And I just, I have to tell this story because Keith um, is our hero in this. Um, we had our second biggest turtle stranding season uh, in the history of the New England Aquarium with about 800 turtles that get caught in the hook of Cape Cod when the waters get cold. Um, we have volunteer pilots and volunteers who scan the beaches and we, we help the turtles. And then this year we had to send them to different places. Uh, on Thanksgiving weekend, we had an ill-fated trip where the plane had to be grounded. It was grounded in Chattanooga. Keith came to the rescue um, and, and was able to get eventually our turtles to New Orleans where they were recuperated and none of them, none of them died. And uh, it's just a great example of how uh, we work individually, but we're also a very connected network of institutions trying to help each other. And then some go to Roger and it's, um, so, so we all have that turtle story that sort of links us that, that's exciting too. That is so wonderful. And, and uh, really kudos to you and your team, uh, Keith, for, for coming to the rescue <laughs> yes. of, of uh, the New England Aquarium. Roger, uh, talk a little bit about how your programs unfold. Then we're going to get back to Keith. Sure. No, absolutely. Here, here, here's what I think is really cool, Mark, that, are, that hopefully everybody appreciates. You have three uh, aquariums that are here to talk to you today. We're still open. We're still actively fulfilling our mission. And yet we've all had different circumstances, as I think you said, you know, right in the beginning. Um, we've done some virtual programming like Vicki has done, but probably not to the extent because here in Florida, you know, we've been a little more open. Um, yeah. You know, as far as a society goes and haven't had to deal with certain things and you can go either way on that. But so one of the things we did is we all closed down somewhere around mid-March last year. I think that was, you know, kind of that they we're coming up on that one year anniversary. It's hard to believe if you want to call it anniversary. But one of one of the things we did here at the Florida Quorum, we weren't sure how it was going to play out. And we felt like we wanted to get open as fast as we can safely um, to provide, uh, to be kind of a community resource, to be, you know, kind of part of this healing process, this mental and emotional uh, connectivity with nature that is so critical and is so being lost, especially in a lot of the urban areas. So I bring that up because on May 10th, we opened, we were one of the first aquariums in North America to, to reopen. Well, thankfully, we have been, we have remained open since uh, we reopened. So while we do some virtual programming, and as Vicki said, this pandemic has had us refocus our, some of our business model on some different ways to fulfill our mission. We've also been open. We've also provided new experiences here. You know, we've had limited uh, uh, attendance for capacity reasons, both by our choice, both by government regulations. But what I will tell you is, you know, we're surveying our guests and we're trying to be that respite for folks who are dealing with the emotional and mental stress of a public health crisis. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of things thriving here in the state of Florida. And so to be able to have people come and see you know, the penguins or the alligators up close or to touch a stingray has allowed us to fulfill you know, not only our mission, but we take that very seriously that folks coming here have a little different mindset about them. And we remind them things like your, your behaviors affect our, you know, our aquatic backyard, our aquatic neighborhood that's here. And so you know, our hope is that we're fulfilling it it's still a lot in person and that folks think about single use plastic or folks think about the, the things that the climate change or the, you know, the ways that they can contribute. So um, we've all been super flexible throughout this process, offered new opportunities. Um, we Like I said, we've been able to do a little more in-person, I think than our colleagues up North and especially in the Northeast have been able to do. And uh, it's been exciting to, again, though, see both Vicki and Keith here, because it means we're, do, we're, 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 we're morphing, we're being flexible for our audiences or finding new ways to fulfill our mission. 
You know, it's very, it's a very interesting point. What you're pointing out is that not only do you have an educational mission, you have a civil society mission. And in this particular case, people are traumatized. And how do you actually use your facilities as a way to try and, and provide a little bit of um, psychological healing, um, maybe a little bit of respite from, from these uh, traumatic times? Uh, Keith, could you talk a little bit about how your programs unfold and, the, and um, how you're, you, you've evolved your programs to deal with COVID and, and, and what the situation is here in terms of your connecting to the audience uh, during this uh, last year? Uh, in which you know people have been traumatized and, and you haven't necessarily been able to operate as normal. Well, we are kind of between Vicky and Roger and that we were closed for 96 days and thankfully hadn't had to close again. But we also, you know, our 501c3 is, is an educational institution, but we can't do school groups. We can't do talks because they congregate too many people together. So unfortunately, we ended up laying off most all of our educators. Uh, because, uh, you know, we just couldn't afford to keep them on without doing anything. But our new, our head of education that joined us about two years ago is using this as an opportunity to step back and look and rebuild a team that will look differently and probably act differently than it did before. We also, we did almost 200 Facebook Live videos and it was interesting. We'd ask people where they were watching from. They were all over the world watching us. And our reach was huge, which was really pretty cool. Recently, we, we have uh, uh, done some meditation videos that people can download from our website and use to meditate themselves for social healing. Um, and, that, and we have added three more live cam views and those are getting, we find news pass all up, like our penguins will be on the weather on a cold day in all cities all over the country and the world. So it's, it's pretty neat. To so, that, so that theme of, of healing through interacting with, with uh, your mission is also very strong. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. I'm going to give uh, Vicki the last word, if you don't mind. And we just finished a poll in which we talked about plastics. Uh, Keith mentioned uh, plastics, uh, Roger did as well. Um, and, and it's interesting how the breakdown um, uh, occurred. We asked um, that, we, we said that much of, the of much of the world's plastics ends up in oceans. Do you personally reduce your plastic use? And we, we had 2% of people say they just don't use plastics. They just don't use them. Some say I avoid using uh, all plastics and others said uh, I use plastics but try to recycle. Vicki, what is your counsel to us as uh, someone who runs a scientific institution that is focused on the oceans? Um, should we, how do we think about plastics as, as a, a really huge part of our pollution problem in the oceans? So I think we do have to understand that it all ends up, you know, downstream and what we're what we are, we can prevent what's ending up in the ocean and we all have a part to play. Someone said that earlier, this is our responsibility. And we have to start by walking the talk, whether that's us in our gift shop, whether that's us in our cafe, whether that's me in my private life. I think the more we can understand how this is all connected and, and limit the use and reuse and recycle as much as we can, I think, I think that we all have that obligation and that responsibility. What would you suggest for me? Should I move from, uh, if, if I see packaging in a store and it's wrapped in plastic, do I move to products that, that use um, paper? There's uh, so or, much you can use. There's, or, you know, there's the metal straws instead of the plastic single use straws, which we've eliminated and we're giving them away in the, in the, the stores. We're cha we change to aluminum bottles instead of plastic water bottles in our facility. The, uh, the good news is more and more options are available these days and it does, you can wrap in, in that wax paper. There's just lots of stuff that um, is an alternative now for people. Yeah, I know in many ways we're the solution. I'd like to thank you all and your people, your people in particular, who have really heroically continued on, on your mission. Thank you so much, um, uh, Roger German, uh, President CEO of the Florida Aquarium, uh, Keith Sanford, President CEO of the Tennessee Aquarium, and Vicki uh, Sprill, 
president and CEO of the New England Aquarium, one of the first modern aquariums in the world and the first in the United States. Thank you all for sharing your work with, uh, with us. Thank your staff. That's the nonprofit report. Yeah. Everybody mask up. Thank you attendees for coming. Thank you for your questions. And everybody stay safe. Mm -hmm.